Okay, so um, there are different components of epigenetics and we are in this lecture and the next uh, lecture, we will continue to talk about each different component. And um, so we start with DNA methylation. This is a modification that happens directly on the DNA. It doesn't change the nucleotide sequence. If we look at this uh, double-stranded DNA, um, it can form the double helix and it can wrap around the histones to form these nucleosomes and then it can be packaged and packaged into the chromosome. DNA methylation really just happened on the DNA location. And so, uh, so you can see here in human genome, most of the DNA methylation happens on C. In bacteria genome, it can happen on other nucleotides as well, but in human, it's mostly happening on the C, especially on the C that's followed by a G. Uh, in stem cells, occasionally, it can be followed by something else, but in most of the adult cells, it's when it's a C followed by a G, that C can be very often methylated. And so uh, there is a process. In, in the early days, people believed that, uh, so you can see this is the uh, cytosine, and there's an enzyme that is involved to add a methyl group on the, the uh, yeah, so the, 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 this part is the DNA that eventually is uh, ACGT, or in this case, it's a C. But um, uh, on this hydrogen bond, if you have an enzyme, DNMT, uh, it will be uh, the methyl group will be added on this uh, carbon location. And um, for many, many years, I would say 60 years after people understand the DNA methylation, they thought this process is irreversible, which means that if the location of the DNA is methylated, in order to demethylate that piece, people initially thought you have to have an enzyme that cuts to the left and cuts to the right, and then you replace the C with an unmethylated C in that location, which is really, really hard to do. Until about 10 years ago, people discovered enzymes that can be involved through very complicated biochemical processes and enzymes such as this TED, uh, or, or genes or such as TED, which can, um, uh, help with the process to demethylate a DNA. And you can see there are some intermediates. And so this is called the 5 hydroxy methylcytosine. This is for, formal cytosine and then carboxycytosine. And then after that, there's another process. Then it will be back to the unmethylated cytosine. And so this process now people know is, you know, it's kind of, a, it can be reversible. Um, in the genome, you have a lot of C. Uh, and also a lot of mes mesylated C and the remaining ones, you can see all of them happen on the C nucleotide. The, the remaining ones probably together only uh, are consist of one to 2% of all the C's in the genome. Most of the C's in the genome are the cytosine and the mesocytosines. And so that's DNA mesylation. And in human, uh, 60 to 80 percent of all the C that's followed by a G. So this is the phosphate groups on two uh, nucleotides. Remember on the DNA backbone that the two nucleotides, there's a phosphor, phosphor uh, uh, location. And so C phosphor G just means there's a G follow the C nucleotide. And so um, 60 to 80 percent of all the C followed by a G are mesylated. But, um, in, in terms of the total DNA basis, it's not a really uh, abundant base because if you only have a C followed by either A or, or a T or, or another A, usually those in mammalian genomes, they are not mesylated. And so the CG is already rare. Also in the human genome, the C and G is not each 25%. It's a small percent. Um, and most of the methylation is found on re repetitive elements of the genome. In fact, uh, human genome is about 50 to 60% uh, of repeats. And so um, most of these repetitive elements, we will, we will talk about that a little bit later, um, are coming from uh, usually uh, viruses that infect the human ritual transposon that gets incorporated in, into the host genome. And so those are being methylated to silence them out. Um, but, but those are the sequence I would say 
a lot of the researchers don't really have a very good way to investigate. Instead, a lot of people are interested in these CPG islands. These are small stretch of DNA sequence, a few hundred to maybe a KB long. And it's highly enriched in C followed by a G, or in general, CG content becomes much higher. And also, of course, CPG content is also higher. And um, um, the CG rich regions has a high density of C and G, and sometimes they do may, uh, remain methylation free. And uh, what is known is that 70% of the human genes have uh, a CPG in the promoter sequence within one to two KB from the transcription star side of a gene. And those CPG island uh, near the gene promoter is very, very important to regulate gene expression. Um, we also want to show here, you can see once you have the C that's methylated, it's usually a symmetric reaction because you can see here, um, if a C is followed by a G on the reverse strand, it's also a C followed by a G. And the methylation usually happens on the two symmetric bases on the C location. So this really happens uh, mostly symmetrically. Oops. And so the... Um, the protein enzymes that are involved for creating the DNA methylation, there are two types of uh, methylation. One is de novo. This is from two copies of the DNA. So remember, we all have we always have two copies, one from the, um, uh, the mom, one from the dad. The two, two copies are, 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 let's see. Sorry, this, this is not uh, the two copies. This is the, uh, C followed by a, sorry, the, in this case, the two strand of C and G, they are both methylated. Well, uh, oh, let me think. It's a good question. I have to go back to this uh, again. So basically, um, when you have, I think this is mom and dad copy as well. If it's a methylated, uh, the, there are enzymes, DNMT3A and 3B, which is involved in the de novo DNA methylation from no methylation to add a DNA methylation. This usually happens during differentiation. So in the embryo, there is one stage in the, the tiny embryos that all DNA methylation is erased. And then as the cell differentiates more and more, and even there are more DNA methylation being added to different cells in my body, as we, even when we are adults. And uh, from no DNA methylation to DNA methylation, this is really uh, uh, a de novo process. And usually this is caused by developmental signals, uh, such as transcription factor binding and things like that. We'll, we'll talk about that a little later. But um, there, there are also uh, replication-related uh, DNA methylation. So remember we say when the cell is dividing, usually the daughter cell still remember the identity of the parent cell. For example, how does a blood cell after dividing know that it's still a blood cell and not a heart or a brain? It's because of epigenetic status and DNA methylation is one such case. And so, um, yeah, so this basically is, uh, if you have DNA methylation, um, I think this is actually the two strand on the DNA. Uh, if it's divided, right, so each is a parental strand for the, for the daughter cell when you duplicate the DNA. And so DNMT1 enzyme will be involved to use one as a template to methylate the other. And so anytime this DNMT1 is a maintenance DNA methylation enzyme. If the two strand, one is methylated, the other is unmethylated, the enzyme will methylate the other unmethylated one uh, during the cell division. And so this, that, that's how the, the child cell or the daughter cell will remember the, the identity, will have the similar epigenetic status as the parent cell. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, inheritance of DNA methylation. As we mentioned in this location, this is the uh, methylation in one base, and this is on the other strand, and also on the C base. And as DNA replication happens, initially the new strand is not methylated, but uh, DNMT enzyme can use the other strand as a template, or if they see that this one strand is methylated, it will try to methylate the other strand that's newly synthesized. 
Um, and so the new cell will again have this symmetric DNA methylation, okay? And so how do we detect the DNA methylation? So there are uh, array-based approaches um, and uh, they are kind of cheaper and they have been used to profile a lot of samples. But for this course, since this year, we kind of uh, eliminated the whole array section. We're gonna talk about sequencing-based way to detect DNA methylation. And so if you get the genomic DNA from a particular cell, um, you can get rid of the proteins that are attached to the cell, but if the DNA is methylated, that methylation still exists in the, in the, on the DNA. We can treat the cell with a bisulfite, which is a reagent, and all the nucleotide that, uh, or, sorry, all the unmethylated C nucleotide with the bisulfite treatment will be converted to a T. If this space is methylated, it will remain to be a C, but if it's unmethylated, the bisulfite treatment will convert the C into a T. And so after this reaction, we can sequence the genome. Um, and actually for that, you need to sequence the genome quite deeply, at least over 30-fold uh, coverage. And you have to pretty much sequence the whole genome. Um, this is a very high resolution. You can know every single nucleotide, whether it is methylated or not. It's also uh, quantitative. You know whether that particular location is 20%, 40%, or 60% methylated. But you can see you have to sequence the genome. So it is quite expensive. Um, although, you know, nowadays sequencing a human genome is not too big a deal. There are experiments called uh, uh, reduced representation by sulfide sequencing, which has some experimental protocols to really just enrich for the CG rich region of the genome so that you don't have to sequence the whole genome 30 times. Instead, you just need to sequence the CG rich locations more. And so after we get the uh, DNA sequencing, um, you will still get a fast Q file, right? You will still do, um, you can still do fast QC to look at the overall sequencing quality. Um, but um, we, we, let, let's first look at this location. Don't worry about remapping for a bit. Let's just look at uh, the, this, uh, supposedly you can map them to this location. Uh, supposedly, this is the original human genome, and you have one read that lands in here. Uh, very often, these reads don't really align exactly jagged like, like, like this. Usually, it's the, they, they cover different regions and they overlap. And if you look at all the overlap that cover this space, for example, in this location, you can see if the reference genome is C, and then uh, when you sequence it, it has two Ts and three Cs, it would mean that. Uh, because if, it, if this C is unmethylated, it will remain to be a C and you can read it out. But if it's uh, unmethylated, it will be converted to a T. And so the fact that you see a T compared to the reference C means that there are about 60% of the, this location that's methylated and 40% unmethylated. Okay, and then another location, because it's all converted to a T, you will know that it's 0% uh, methylated. Right, so uh, that's why you can see here, in order to really get a quantitative measure of DNA methylation, you need to have a pretty deep sequencing of pretty much every region you want to look at in the genome to look at uh, the DNA methylation pattern in that location. So, which naturally comes to the question, how do we really map this to the genome? Um, you can see here, um, the mapping is quite complicated because every time you see a C, in the reference genome, uh, in the mapping, remember with both BWA and uh, uh, StarSeq, well, in this case, the mapping will be kind of like BWA because you don't care about splicing, you just care about mapping it to the reference genome, except that at every location when there is a, uh, a so if the reference genome has a C, um, the bisulfide sequencing can convert it to, uh, a T, or if it's methylated, it will remain to be a C, right? And if the reference genome is a T, bisulfide sequencing will not do much, it will still be a T. And so remember with BWA, in order to map it, you need a reference index. So you run BWA with this reference index. But um, with bisulfide sequencing, it's complicated because when the reference genome is a C, 
in the actual final read, it can be either a C or a T. For example, if you look at this particular read, which is A T T T C G, um, it could be that the first T is really a T in the reference genome, but it could also be that the reference genome is a C and it's being converted to a T by the bisulfide treatment. And the second base, uh, it, it could also be a reference a C or a reference T. The third base could be a reference C and reference T. And also, the, the, you can see here, it could be that they're adjacent Cs or adjacent Ts, right? So anytime you see a C or a T, there is a complication. So actually, the reference index for the bisulfide sequence mapping is much, much bigger. So you have to create a bigger index of the genome. Uh, using basically every, every time you use a rep, you see a C in the genome, you have to come try to convert it to a T and create an index for that as well. Okay, so it is uh, uh, takes much longer to, to map. There are some computational algorithms that are developed, uh, such as this uh, Bismarck algorithm. You basically create additional sequence in the BW index to account for the potential C to T conversion. And so in the CG rich region, this can create a, because for example, if your read is fairly long and there are many Cs that can be converted to a T, it's a comp, uh, like a exponentially increase. Every time you see a C, next time you see a C, the third time you see a C, they all can be converted to a T. And so that reference genome can be pretty big. Okay. And um, another question I kind of want to ask you is, um, if you do see uh, this location being, uh, say, if you have a read that map to the C or T, or sorry, sometimes you see a, 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 a sequence like this, um, that's mapped to the plus strand of the genome, except that these positions are changed, right? It's a C or this could be a T. Um, some of those can be coming from the bisulfide treatment, but we know that between you and me, uh, our genome is 99.99% similar, but there are occasional bases that are different from the current reference genome and between you and me. So sometimes you kind of have to wonder, is this really uh, a conversion of C to T because of DNA methylation, or it's because uh, the reference genome has C, but this this guy has a different nucleotide in its DNA originally. They just happen to have a T in that location. Do you know how you can tell them apart? Um, in order to tell them apart, you have to look at the other strand. Because when you do DNA sequencing, you do you roughly cover both strands evenly by chance, right? So let's think about this case. Um, if this base is naturally a T uh, because of a nucleotide, like really this, this guy's DNA in that location is indeed a T. It's not uh, um, because of a uh, bisulfide conversion. And if that is the case, then in the reverse complement strand, it should be a, you know, this is a G, this the reverse complement should be a C. And if the original DNA in this location is a T, the reverse complement should have an A. Whereas um, if the reference genome is a C and it's being converted into a T by bisulfide sequencing, then what that reverse strand should be is the reverse strand, this location should be a C and this location should be a G. And if this space is being converted to a T, it would mean that it's, this, this C base is unmesylated, right? Be because you, you are able to use bisulfide to convert the C into a T, then this C is unmesylated. And if this space is unmethylated, the reverse complement that this C should also be unmesylated. And so if you look at the reverse strand, you see a TG, that would mean that the original DNA is really just T, uh, is CG, and it's because of the bisulfide treatment. But um, if, you, uh, if you read a TG and the reverse complement is a CA, that tells you it's because of this nucleotide originally was just TG, 
Okay, so even though you read one strand, it's like, huh, is it really original TG or converted TG? You can look at the reverse strand and you can guess that. Um, and this uh, way, you, you don't actually have to sequence the N bisulfide treated genome. So you can think uh, one way is to really sequence this guy's genome without a bisulfide treatment, right? You will know what is the actual DNA sequence is, you compare with the bisulfide treated one. But in this case, because you can sequence the reverse strand, you will know what the original DNA sequence is by just looking at the bisulfide treated DNA. Uh, Kevin. Ah, so the question is, does the tool look into the reverse complement and tell you the base? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, so the tool already can, so basically when you sequence, half of the read will map to the plus strand, half of the read will map to the reverse strand, and it will automatically look at those spaces and it will call which location are methylated, at what percentage, it will report that information to you. Okay, so these are, so you, otherwise you just give it index, you run BWA, you don't need a separate tool, right? Yeah, okay. So that's some interesting analysis issues. Um, so, uh, um, so far, um, a lot of work on DNA methylation has been done, and there are some interesting things that can be useful in the analysis. The first thing people notice is that the DNA methylation levels within a short distance, in terms of short distance, we're talking about maybe a few hundred base pair away, um, because sometimes you might have a CG in here, um, and then a, a not, the next CG could be a, a few bases or maybe a hundred bases away. And usually when things are quite close, their DNA methylation are, are usually in similar states. And so if you want to know the overall DNA methylation level in that whole chunk, you could smooth out the signals from, so you say there, there's a CG here, there's a CG there, there's a CG there. You could look at a, a 1 KB region and, and collect all the CGs in that region and average there. Uh, CG methylation levels, and that will give you a potentially more accurate result if you don't sequence it deep enough. Because if you don't sequence the gen genome deep enough, maybe you don't have enough coverage in some of the CG bases, but you can borrow information from nearby. That can just be done with a smoothing window cr across the genome. Um, another interesting phenomenon people observe is that in the same cell, uh, a particular region is usually either mostly methylated or mostly unmethylated. Um, you rarely see a region, well, so occasionally you do see this as um, half methylated and half unmethylated in the genome. So far, we, people only know probably around 100 well, this, this number still changed. Early days, people think it's 80. Now people think it's like uh, maybe that, that's definitely less than 200 uh, such regions where the mom copy and the dad copy have di di different methylation status. This is quite unusual. Uh, there needs to be some specific mechanisms to know which one is the mom copy and the dad copy. And um, there are some hypotheses suggesting it arises from uh, a competition between the, the dad's desire and the mom desire. So the dad desire is for their baby to grow really, really big, as big as possible. And the mom didn't want this baby to be too big so that um, in the birth, it will be too dangerous to the mom. And so the DNA isolation level is, the difference between the mom and dad is like, they're trying to battle out on this, on, on this baby so the baby will grow out at, at the right, right uh, uh, um, size. But these things are really, really rare. Think about like a, a 3 billion base pair genome. There are only about a hundred of such regions present. Most of the other locations, the mom copy and the dad copy are um, similarly methylated. And uh, uh, therefore, in, a, in a one particular cell in that location, uh, either both copies are methylated or both copies are unmethylated. In fact, if you look at a cell, uh, if you have a cell that's growing in petri dish uh, cell light, um, in each location, it's either methylation of 100 or methylation of zero. Very few cases you see around 50%. And so this can actually be used to estimate the tumor purity. Um, 
because you, you can imagine um, when you are trying to sequence the tumor, sometimes we may not know the tumor purity, but uh, we can imagine it's a kind of a mix between the normal and the tumor. And if there are difference in tumor uh, content, and supposedly there are some regions that the tumors are all methylated, whereas the normal are, or are all unmethylated, or it can be reverse way, right? And so when you sequence the read, you can see here, um, so by the way, each dot here, each column here represents one CPG island, uh, sorry, CPG uh, nucleotide. And each row represents one sample, right? So supposedly you have this region that's uh, all methylated in multiple patients, uh, sorry, in, uh, not sample, each, each row represents one cell. Each column represents one CPG. And so imagine now, you mush this tumor together and you do the sequencing. And if this read is coming from this region from the tumor, you will see that most of these CGs will be methylated. And occasionally you might, you might have an unmethylated base, but that could be that bisulfite treatment is not perfect. It also could be that uh, you just you know, didn't read this correctly or something. But most of this should be fairly consistent. Um, within the read. But then you will see another read around the same region that's kind of amethylated. And so that's actually an indication that this, this sample is not pure. There are some two component of cells available. And this is if you only look at one CPG island. If you look at, you know, if you look at multiple CPG islands together, you will see that the ratio is supposedly uh, if you have 50% tumor and 50% normal, then you will see genome-wide a lot of regions that have 50-50 DNA methylation. That will tell you, oh, this is 50% uh, tumor purity. But um, if you have a lot of regions that are like 70-30 or 40-60, that, that will give you an idea that it's a 70-30 purity or 60-40 purity. Yes, questions? How uh, so the question is whether it is always the tumor that is, uh, yeah, yeah, so Patrick's question is whether you always have tumors that are methylated and normals that are unmethylated. It's not always the, the case. Um, in fact, you will see that uh, in, in this case, um, the DNA methylation on a different uh, CPG island, there will be noise. But if it's a tumor normal uh, difference, you will see a, a majority of the region that you see a 70-30 difference. It's not always tumor being the 70. Tumor could be the 30. In fact, in the same tumor, it could be sometimes the normal is methylated, the tumor is unmethylated, but it will still give you that 70-30 uh, difference. And that's what tell you that there is a 70-30 difference. And then you might need to look at a few locations to see, because there are some well-known locations, our oh, tumor is methylated, normal is unmethylated. And then you will know which, uh, wh whether the tumor is the 30% or the 70%. Okay, so that's actually useful. Um, so um, that, that's the general uh, things that people do with the analysis side. Then we will talk about the functional side of DNA methylation.